Hey guys, and welcome back to a special episode of Philips Android News. Because as some of you will probably know, um, last week there was Google I.O. Google I.O. is yeah, a yearly event by Google in which they basically present the hardest new shit in terms of the Google ecosystem. And since Android, of course, plays a major role in Google's ecosystem, there are a lot of new announcements and changes they actually presented that affect us Android developers. So this is therefore going to be an out of schedule episode because usually I post these uh, Android news every first Wednesday of the month. So usually the next one would be first Wednesday in June, but I will actually do this Android news a little bit earlier, which is this video here, because there are just so many changes and then I will probably not do one at uh, the first June, I think. And oh boy, guys, I know I had one or the other rant here in the previous Android news episodes about some permission stuff and all the changes of Android 13, but I must say what they actually announced here on Google I.O. is super promising and there are so many cool changes. So definitely make sure to watch this till the end and then you can be sure that you're up to date with everything that will come to us Android developers in future. But before we actually get to the latest Android news, one more thing. If you actually want to learn more about the life of a programmer behind the scenes, then I actually just made an Instagram page to share exactly that. And my mission there is just to inspire people that coding and specifically Android development is really the perfect way, in my opinion, to create a life full of freedom and joy because that is in the end exactly what it did for me and for my life. And to do that, I will share my coding journey over the past 11 years already. And I will share also stuff like general coding tips, coding mindset tips, uh, tips for freelancers, how you can start your coding business and just, of course, my journey, my learnings, what I've learned in the past. So all that stuff I will share in stories, in posts, in reels. And if you want to learn about that and you want to learn more about me, if you want to interact with me more closely than it is possible here in the YouTube comments, then definitely follow that page. You will find the link down below and I will actually make a giveaway among all people who follow that page. I will actually give away three times my ultimate course bundle from my website, which will contain all my paid courses among all people who will now follow me and also send me a DM that they would actually like to participate in this giveaway. So simply follow me, send me a DM. Hey, Philip, I want to uh, take part at this giveaway and then you're already in. But without further ado, let's jump directly into Android news because this episode has so many exciting new changes and I want to start with Jetpack Compose. Jetpack Compose has a new beta version which is 1.2.0 and there are some cool changes in that version. So a lot of you will know either a lazy vertical grid in Compose and lazy horizontal grid in Compose just to build a typical grid layout. These were marked as experimental by Google which is now not the case anymore. So you don't need this extra annotation anymore that this is marked as experimental. I know Google likes to keep these annotations pretty much forever, but now that's removed and it feels a little better to actually use these lazy vertical grid and lazy horizontal grid. But that's not it for these lazy components because Google also introduced a new lazy layout and that is a great way to actually now build custom layouts with that lazy loading functionality so that when you scroll, new composables will, will actually be composed and enter the screen and those that actually leave the screen will be kind of, yeah, will kind of be uncomposed. Is that a, can you say that? It, they will basically be destroyed. Another change is that they improved the interoperability of coordinator layout with composables by a lot. So typically it was quite a struggle to make coordinator layout from XML work together with composables. So if you have a coordinator layout in an XML and you want to migrate your project to Compose, then that was not quite possible because um, Compose had some kind of different scroll mechanism and uh, scroll triggers than the coordinator layout actually had. But starting with Compose 1.2.0 or the beta actually, that's not the case anymore. So you can now perfectly use coordinator layout in composables. And also, yeah, if you then use, for example, a lazy column in that coordinator layout, then that will work just fine. Then a cool new change are window classes. Those who actually saw my video about making Compose apps responsive saw me do exactly that. So what I did, I specified different classes for different types of screens, you can say. So you can, could have a class for small devices, you could have a class for large phones, you could have a 
clouds for tablets or expanded screens or so. And you can then easily use these and check what the current device or which class it would fit into. And depending on that, you show different content on your screen. And that is now included in the actual Material 3 library by default, which you can use for Jetpack Compose, so you don't need to implement this class on your own anymore. So in the end, it will become easier to support multiple screen sizes with Compose. Let's get to the next big section of changes, and those will all be related to new Android Studio versions. Yes, you heard that correctly, there will be new versions. So on the one hand, there will be Android Studio Dolphin, which is the next version after uh, Chipmunk, I think. And then there will be Android Studio Electric Eel, which is kind of a cool name, I think. And those two versions, or about those two versions, they actually presented quite some cool changes, which I will now go through. What I like a lot is that they improved the performance tooling for Jetpack Compose by a lot. What does that mean? we now will have a function to actually see directly within Android Studio in the Compose preview how often specific composables recompose. That will be so useful to actually determine or to, to find performance bottlenecks in your Compose UI. And it won't only be useful to measure the performance of your app right now, it will also be very useful to compare it with the performance of your app after you made some change. So after you made some potential optimization, you can again check, did that actually improve the performance of your Compose layout by just needing less recompositions? And in the later Android Studio version Electric Eel, it will even contain some kind of highlighter that will highlight as soon as a Composable actually recomposes. So you also have that visual feedback for that. Then another cool change regarding the Compose preview section is, that you can now use annotations to actually define multiple previews at once. So till now we are only able to actually have one single preview, one single preview annotation, but starting with, uh, I'm not sure if Dolphin or Electric Eel, but one of these, you will actually be able to have multiple composed previews. So multiple composables or multiple screens, whatever you would like. So this will be a really cool thing, especially if you develop an app that looks quite differently on different screens. So you could have one tablet preview, you could have one phone preview, maybe a smartwatch preview. So all these different screen sizes and you can just yeah, look at these all at once while you develop your composable and you see that um, those changes in life. And yes, guys, you heard that correctly. Jetpack Compose will get a live edit feature. I think that is something most Compose lovers actually waited for, that we now have a live edit. So pretty similar to Flutter's Hot Reload, that you directly see changes in your UI in the Compose preview. So it doesn't work if your app runs on your phone, on your emulator. But if you have that in a preview in Android Studio, then you can make changes in your composable and you directly see them without needing to rebuild. And that is such a big and cool change, I love it. I personally haven't tried it out yet because for that you need the Canary version of Electric Eel, but I have heard some other people who tried that out and they said it runs really well and yeah, is pretty much live, so it works pretty good. So it is currently an opt-in feature, so even if you have that Canary version of Electric Eel, you still need to opt into this using the uh, settings in Android Studio, I think. And there's even one more very cool change regarding Compose Preview, and that is that we get an integrated animation preview for Composables directly inside of Android Studio. So you will now have, yeah, you will now see your animation and you can directly change uh, some kind of time slider when you actually want to inspect that animation and just see how it would look like without actually opening your app and then just seeing that animation for half a second and then needing to, needing to try it out again. No, you now have a very nice integrated animation editor and animation inspector so you can easily see how your animation behaves. And the next big change here in regards to these Android Studio versions is that they rebuilt Lockhead from the ground up and they now call it Lockhead V2. The problem the Google team saw with the old Lockhead that we use right now um, is that they they think that it was not so good to actually filter out specific information that we were looking for and when I think of this I kind of agree I never saw this as a real problem like I wasn't really aware of this but when I now think about it it was quite often the case that you try to find a specific log or specific type of logs and then you yeah you just fill it out too much you fill it out uh, way too little so you had that big big um, file of logs and I think 
that can really be improved by just having some better filter mechanisms to better highlight what is an error, what is not an error. I know you can change these colors in the settings, but yeah, as far as I saw from their image, that will change quite a lot and it will really improve LawCat. Then another thing that changes for these Android Studio versions is that they will now have a Crashlytics integration. So Firebase Crashlytics, if you're actually using an app that you distribute to a larger user base, then you actually want to make sure that you catch and gather these crash logs. So when on one user's device the app crashes, you want to make sure that you actually get that crash log to see what that issue was and why the app might have crashed. And for that you use Firebase Crashlytics. And starting from these Android Studio versions, it will have an integrated tab in Android Studio where you can directly get information about a specific crash, so specific line of code. You can see, okay, I want to see um, on which devices actually this line of code crashed. And then you can directly see that in Android Studio, which devices that crashed, on which Android versions. So you get a lot of a lot more in information about your users' crashes inside of Android Studio without needing to navigate to the Firebase panel. Then the next change will be relevant for those of you who still use XML layouts, and that is that you will get visual lints. So what does that mean? Android Studio will have quite some warnings integrated that detect when specific things of your layouts are wrong. So let's say you add some kind of button or text on your screen and it looks fine on a phone, but then Android Studio will actually detect that it might not look fine on a tablet because it might be out of the screen and it might not be fully visible. And it will then get a new linting tool that will give you a warning that, that says, hey, on the tablet screen, it actually doesn't look like you expect. Then the next changes will be regarding Android emulators. A cool feature that these emulators will get is resizability. So you will have the option to quickly resize your emulator to see how your app um, looks like and behaves on larger screens. And something also relating to Android emulators that I love is that they get Bluetooth support. Or at least not full Bluetooth support as I understood it, but you will have the option to have two emulators running and simulate a Bluetooth connection between these two. And that is so cool. You might now wonder, okay, why don't you just use your real device, which is much more stable than the Android emulator, which is true, but if you have an app and you need, if, if you actually have a Bluetooth app, then you normally need two devices to test that. Not everybody has two devices, two real devices to test the Bluetooth app, so they can use the Android emulators instead. Or let's take another example. Sometimes I work on um, smartwatch apps, so on Wear OS. And these smartwatches very often use a Bluetooth connection to talk to some kind of other app. And since I personally don't have a physical smartwatch, I, there, there's no way I could test this uh, interaction between the smartwatch and the mobile app. But with this new Android emulator change, I can actually test that because I can just run a Wear OS emulator. And there is even one more cool change regarding these Android Studio versions before I get to the next category, and that is device mirroring. So you will have the option to mirror your device screen right inside of Android Studio. So it's kind of an emulator, but you use your real device, and that's, yeah, the communication is all happening either via USB or Wi-Fi. That is what I currently already do in my videos using a tool called Visor, but that is actually a paid tool, at least if you want a decent quality. and from the future on, that feature will be implemented in Android Studio by default and you will have it directly as a tab in Android Studio, which will be very useful actually for my videos because then I don't always need to switch between windows to actually show you what I built. And let's get to the last big section here of this news episode and that is Google Play. The biggest change here is that Google introduced something that is called the Google Play SDK Index. And that is basically a collection of third-party SDKs and libraries that you can go through and that you can use to find which one of these is actually the best one for your use case and for your app. So you can then use this index to just have an easy integration of your preferred third-party SDK. You will get some extra lints regarding that. I think they talked of uh, over 50 different lints, so warnings that you can get, for example, if a specific version um, is claim to not be supported anymore by the author of that SDK. And if you actually want to see which of these um, SDKs are actually included in that index, I'm sure they will extend it in future, but um, I will include a link to their website where you can just um, browse through that. I'm not sure if that's going to be included in Android Studio in future. That's something I haven't found out. So it would be cool if you would just have some kind of 
yeah, tap in Android Studio where you can just browse through these third party SDKs and you don't have to go to the Google website. That is actually one of my biggest wishes I have for Android Studio, that we have some integrated dependency management tool that we can just browse through common dependencies from GitHub, from uh, yeah, these typical dependency management website where you can just easily find these dependency strings, implementation, blah, blah, blah. You can easily find the latest version without just needing to endlessly Google for that. And then, yeah, realizing that this specific library is deprecated or so. I know that IntelliJ has such a feature and that is an indicator that it might come for Android Studio in the future, but right now there is no such feature, sadly. And then another big change here is that now the Android 13 beta is out and you can now try this out on your, I think only Pixel devices. So you can download that and install it on your devices and try that out give feedback to Google, which they will highly appreciate. And uh, yeah, I think I will actually do that. And those who actually regularly watch these Android news episodes here, which I hope all of you do, then you will already know most, the change, most of the changes regarding Android 13 and the beta for that. But there is one more change they actually announced and that are predictive back gestures. So normally when you have an Android app and the user presses the back button, then a lot of different things could happen. So sometimes the keyboard gets hidden, sometimes your app might close a bottom sheet, sometimes it just navigates to the previous screen, sometimes the app closes. So there are a lot of different scenarios that could, um, yeah, that, that could emerge from a back button press. And starting from Android 13, you will have the option to opt in to predictive back gestures. So the, the goal of the Google team here is to, to help the user um, predict what happens if they press the back button. So for, for example, if the back button would actually close your app after a back press, then they would actually reflect that. So when, when, they, when the user actually uses the back gesture by swiping, then they would reflect that by just um, shrinking down the screen a little bit. So the user would see, okay, now if I actually finish this gesture, then my app will close. I'm still not fully sure how they will actually handle this with custom back on back press dispatchers because yeah, a lot of things could happen there and in the end you could just not do anything. Um, so I don't know how they handle this, but all in all, that sounds like a pretty solid idea. And if you want to learn about the other features that Android 13 actually includes and the changes for us Android developers, which aren't actually all so cool, <laughs> then check out the previous two Android episodes. It's definitely important for anyone who is serious with Android development. And now to finish this up, what is actually my opinion about all these changes that were announced here? Yeah, I'm pretty blown away, I have to say. Um, I know I had some rants here and there, but these changes all sound pretty solid and make full sense to me. I think there's just one thing that comes a little bit short here, because if we, if we consider all these changes, then all those are new things, new features into Android Studio. And one of the most common complaints I see from people is that Android Studio just doesn't run that stable or you need some kind of uh, $5,000 machine to actually run it somehow smoothly. And to me at least, it feels like a little bit they ignore these requests to make Android Studio more performant or maybe they also just don't know how to make it more performant. For example, one issue I always have is I can't run any type of Android emulator if I run that in a tool window instead of Android Studio. So that is just the whole feature that is broken. It, it just doesn't work. And there are tons of these things depending on which uh, machine Android Studio actually runs on. I'm sure you all will know this, that Android Studio very often doesn't run reliably, that you have to invalidate caches and restart your IDE for like 10 times to make something work. Yeah, and all these things. I wish they would actually also focus on these things a little bit and not only push in new features into the IDE, which might, it, which might actually lead to the fact that it runs even slower but the changes they want to make are actually great in my opinion. What do you actually think about these new changes? I would be really happy to hear about that in the comments. Do you like all these? Do you think um, they should also make the IDE more performant? Do you think there's something else they actually missed um, actually announcing here on the Google I.O.? Let us know in the comments and if you want to see the previous Android News episode from, what is that, April, which is still super relevant, regarding Android 13, then simply click here.